I mean, this is a story that um, Peg's story has been kind of uh, buried under an avalanche of Hollywood lore for so many decades. Uh, and, and so the, you, you never really got a sense of who she was. Uh, mm-hmm. over the years. So this is a great treat. And, and I guess my first question to you is, um, when you write a book like this, and you spend so many years, you spent something like seven years researching it, does, does it feel like her story kind of becomes a, 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 a part of you in a way? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it, um, actually, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense. That's exactly what happens. Um, to to many biographers, um, it certainly did happen to me. Um, I, I had a sense almost immediately when I first when I first Googled her name, um, and I saw these different accounts from things like Wikipedia and different blogs or different authors who had included her in a few paragraphs in their book about you know um, Hollywood mystery and scandals or you know, Hollywood history or the history of the sign or things of this nature, tragic actors and actresses, you know, the golden age. And, and I saw this, this girl who, um, she just seemed so, so frail and, and, and so, so frightened. And so I, I kind of, I kind of gravitated to a feeling where I, I felt almost an immediate sense of like, sort of being like a, a protector of her in a way. Yeah. Um, like a like an older brother who maybe who lost his sister um, is the only way I could really kind of describe it. And the more I learned about her, I mean, you know, the closer I became, uh, I almost, I don't want to get like goofy with it, like a supernatural paranormal thing, because it, it really wasn't like that. But it was a psychological uh, uh, overtaking. I, I just felt not obsessed, but uh, determined and I felt like, in a way, that she was she was there, kind of hovering over me. Um, and then when I met her family, when I met her brother, who was 15 when she died, and then spoke with her cousin Helen, who was about 19, and spent uh, you know much of Peg's last day with her, mm. I felt an even more um, uh, powerful. Um, sense of awareness about this girl and uh, I you know I, I held a piece of jewelry that she was wearing when she died I held that in my hand and you know reading letters that she had written surviving letters that her family has you know and uh, you know letters that uh, you know outlined some of the pathos she was going through in her final days and I, so yeah I, I, I became a re- in a real sense you know she became a part of me and I became a part of her well, when you when you talk about Peg Entwistle, um I mean it's generally used as a story that's uh, emblematic of uh, dashed dreams of Hollywood and and mm-hmm. the, the, the tragic side of Hollywood, all all of right. that mis- mystique that's built up around her over the years. How how did her remaining uh, living family members how, how did they respond to that? Well, um, they they held to much of the um, much of the story um, that had hovered over around Hollywood all these years, um, which in in large part was exaggeration. Um, they didn't know much about her career, and they didn't even really know too much about her private life because they never. Her brother, he was a kid, he was 15, and, you know, um, so he he wasn't really aware of, you know, a lot of the things that Peg was going through. They they kind of sheltered him from a lot of uh, the anguish that she had, um, but they, they had a, the general belief that, um, you know, she killed herself because, you know, she got let go by RKO. Mm-hmm. Um, they never really studied her letters in detail like I did and I was able to use the letters and, and put them alongside of what I learned about her career and some other uh, writings that I found um, from friends of hers who are fellow actors and I was able to uh, 
kind of, I don't want to say debunk, because it was one of the rungs of her ladder getting let go by RKO, having her her dreams uh, shattered. But the dreams weren't really of becoming a movie star. As I point out in the book, you know, uh, Peg left Hollywood. She was already here. She didn't want to pursue film. She wanted to pursue the stage. Mm. She grew up around the stage. And the shattered dreams that really put an end to her uh, was when she had gotten blacklisted from Broadway because she had broken a promise to a, a high-profile producer. And uh, she did want to make films. She did like it. She was bitten by the bug. There's no question about it. Uh, her cousin Helen remembers her squealing with delight when George Cooper called the house mm. and offered her a role originally for Bill of Divorcement. Uh, and she was going to, you know, co-star with Billy Burke. And here she was already appearing on stage in the, in uh, L.A. with Billy Burke. Um, so she she enjoyed the acting. She enjoyed the attention it got. And uh, I think uh, she probably would have continued to make films. But the stage was her real true love. And that was really what the Shattered Dream was. It wasn't the... the um, the old story so much about her coming to Hollywood to make it big on the silver screen. That's not what happened at all. Well, where, just for, for, for our listeners' sakes, um, that haven't read the book and I, I want to convince them to, to do so, uh, tell me where and, and how her dream of becoming an actress began. Well, it has its roots, really, when she was three years old. She grew up now, she was Welsh-born, but she was of uh, English uh, citizenship. Her parents, they were living in West London and uh, 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 in Kensington. And, uh, you know, everywhere around the corner, I mean, they had, there was theater, mostly, you know, Shakespeare, but there was theater everywhere. And her father and her uncle were an actor, and she had an aunt who was a, uh, an actor. And um, at three years old, uh, Peg's, father and uncle, uh, performed in a scene from a Shakespeare, from Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, during the coronation of uh, King George V. And Peg sat in a little pushchair at three years old, and that's her first real experience to theater. And, you know, everywhere she went, uh, she was surrounded by people in the theater, People in her family, when they went out, they had get-togethers. So it was like in her DNA, yeah. you know, and films, you know, at that age, she's, you know, we're talking, you know, from 1911 on, you know, when she was three and she saw this performance in His Majesty's Theater and there up in the balcony is the King and Queen of England and she's in the little wings and, you know, everywhere her family went, whether it was in England or later when they came to New York, and went to work for Charles Froman, who was the Steven Spielberg of the day for theater. Uh, her whole life was surrounded by these people, and she was at a show nearly every night, even when she didn't understand the, the, the content. She didn't understand the drama or the story. But I knew that she understood the reaction that her father and her uncle uh, and her aunts on her father's side were getting when they were on the stage, whether it was laughter, whether it was tears. And that's what really moved her. And at her earliest age, when they asked her what she wanted to be, she said she wanted to be on the stage. And she wanted to be the greatest actress since Maude Adams, who at that time had been one of the uh, most successful stage actresses of the day. And she um, she just fell in love with it. She She collected all the scripts. She hobnobbed, and, and as a little girl, it, you know, she was just a cute, adorable little thing, and so it was hard for anybody to say no to her when she would ask them questions about theater. So she studied theater, not just from the point of, of an actor's point of view. She studied its history. She studied the mechanics. She studied uh, everything that could be learned about theater. She wanted to learn, and she did, and she became a prodigy, and by the time she was 17, she had nearly 200 plays memorized. 
Wow. Wow. So that would be, uh, yeah, that's, that's where it had its genesis. I think from that time she was, she watched her father and her uncle perform for the King of England back in 1911. So uh, obviously acting, acting for the theater was this all consuming passion. Um, oh, what, what, yes. Uh, it was in her what, DNA. Yeah. So, what kind of, what kind of young woman was she? I mean, was she? She was obviously determined. Was she outgoing and well liked? She was. She was well liked, but she was. Um, one of the things that I had to make sure that I did, and my editor Eve Golden, who had written the forward, uh, she's a terrific biographer, and Eve warned me right away. She said, "You know, don't fluff Peg up." Don't put her on this pedestal. You you have to tell all sides of the story. And one of the sides is that she had a big ego. She did like attention, even in her uh, early years as a young girl and then as a teenager. But she was very, very bright. Uh, she wasn't conceited. So I, I don't want people to think that she was one of these, you know, nose-in-the-air actors or actresses. Um she was very determined. She was very bright. She was very intelligent. Um, she was able to memorize um, entire uh, scripts in a few hours. Uh, Harvard called her a prodigy. Uh, and she was a terrific mimic. One of the things that she used to like to do, because she liked being the center of attention, especially when she was worth it. And she would mimic all the big actresses of the day. Uh, Billy Burke was one of the queens of the stage then, and Ethel Barrymore, and Lorette Taylor. Um, and she ended up working with all three of these ladies. And she was very good at mimicking. She had all the gestures down, the movements, the uh, inflections of the voice, you know, the sing-song mannerisms. And she became quite proficient at that. And then really it tickled her, you know, her family and, and, and their friends and acquaintances. But she didn't do well among, you know, kids her age. She always seemed to behave as an adult because I think she was acting like an adult. And so for that reason, that was one of the reasons that she didn't do well in public school. And uh, she was teased. And... Uh, uh, maybe they thought she was stuck up, and her having an English accent probably didn't help matters, you know, especially when they came out here to uh, to Hollywood. So mm -hmm. she uh, went in large part to either private schools or she was homeschooled. And while she did like to do the girl things, she enjoyed um, hiking. She liked horses. Her and horses just got along famously. She was a proficient horseback rider. And she loved fishing, and she loved to shoot rifles. And so she was very adventurous and outgoing and athletic. But at the same time, she liked to be this kind of, um, you know, she liked to be like the actress, if you will. Um, she, um, she enjoyed the spotlight. And when she was on, she was on. And um, I think she was hiding some pain. And I think she overcompensated. But while, you know, I'm kind of straying, but she would read the, the, the film fan magazines that were coming out, even though she didn't really have an interest in movies when she was, you know, 14, 15, 16 and coming of age. Theater was always her life, and she missed Broadway while she was living out here. She fell in love. Broadway was her home and her heart. And, but she would read the fan magazines because many of the actresses in her day, about 75, 80% of them were also stage actresses. And she enjoyed reading about their, uh, you know, their, uh, whether it was their shenanigans or their new uh, projects uh, or their, uh, um, you know, everyday life or makeup tips or um, fashion. And so she used to get kind of scolded by her grandmother for burying her nose in all these magazines. But her uncle pointed out that Peg Entwistle was probably the only actress in Hollywood at the time, that's at 15, 16, 17, who would come to the breakfast table with, um, um, you know, with, 
uh, uh, you know, a history book with, uh, you know, uh, the works of Herodotus and Josephus under her arm, tucked near a, uh, um, tucked near, uh, you know, a uh, Vogue magazine. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Uh... Uh, but tell me about she. She moved when she moved to the states. Did she? She moved with her father. Did she? Yes. What happened was this. The old story had always been that, um, and I'm, I'm not sure where it started, but it, this was, and this is what I believe for my first two years uh, during the research until I met her family two years into the project. Um, was that her 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 mother, her biological mother, had died in England. And then Peg came here to the States after her father got hired by Charles Froman. Uh, uh, Peg's uncle, the brother of her father, was a stage manager under Charles Froman, and he had been managing Billy Burke's publicity uh, in New York at the time. And uh, Froman came, Froman used to come every year to visit James Berry in England. And then, um, and then he would, you know, check on his theater concerns in England. He owned 200 theaters, and he had about 700 actors under contract, and many of them in England. And so he went once a year for a couple months uh, through England, mostly on business. And on one occasion, he brought Charles, he brought uh, Peg's uncle Charles, and um, introduced Charles Froman. The uncle introduced Charles Froman to her father and to Peg. And ended up giving him a job and brought him to the States. So uh, 1913 is when Peg came here with her father to New York. And um, soon after that, uh, Peg's father met uh, the future stepmom. Her name was Loretta Ross, and she was the sister of Charles's wife. So the brothers, I like. I think it's very cute that... Uh, uh, that the brothers in Twistle married the sisters Ross. And these were the American uh, sisters from Ohio. And so in 1913, uh, Peg is um, in New York with her father, and then she, she um, likes very much this new woman in their life, this Loretta Ross. And her father marries after a year of proper courting. And now Peg has a new stepmom. And for the next eight years, you know, things are things are wonderful in their life. Uh, and then poor Loretta, then she passed away of uh, meningitis, and that shattered Peg. And then 18 months later, her father was killed on Park Avenue when he got run over by a hit-and-run driver. Mm. And Peg's aunt, Loretta's sister, Jane, and her husband, Peg's uncle, Charles, uh, they ended up uh, adopting Peg and her two brothers. Uh, her two brothers are her brothers through the stepmom. So from 1913 until 1922, Peg is uh, mostly in New York. They hadn't come out to Hollywood. There were no plans to come out to Hollywood for Peg and her father. Although her uncle and Jane Ross, his wife, they did make a few films out here, mostly up in the Santa Cruz area. So Hollywood didn't come into the picture uh, as far as living, and it had, it had nothing to do with, uh, with acting until her, uh, her parents were dead now. And the reason I know that the biological mother uh, was still alive was because four days before he died of his injuries, Peg's father uh, gave a seven-page detailed will and in this will, he stipulates that um, that the two sons are to go to his brother and his wife, and along with Peg, and that Peg is not to be given to his ex-wife mm. because the courts had given him custody of Peg. And we don't know why they got divorced, and we don't know why the courts had given custody of Peg to her father, Robert. But this occurred in about 1908. So I imagine that, and that was in England. So I'm assuming it was probably infidelity, but I don't know for sure. Do you know what, do you know what ever happened to her birth mother? 
No, I don't. The, 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 the way the will is worded, it seems as if she was in the States and somewhere in the East, perhaps even New York. Because there seems to be a sense of urgency. He, he's very careful how he words it, and he's, he's careful to detail and make sure that, uh, that everyone knows, that all the attorneys know who also co-signed uh, the will and uh, the other witnesses, that you know he does have legal custody of Peg, and he does not want her to go into the custody of uh, her mother. Mm. But I, you know, I, I spent the entire time, you know, back and forth, you know, looking for her, and through contacts in England, and when she just disappeared. It's just uh, I have no idea what happened to her. Did her success on the stage? Did that uh, did that occur after her father's death? Peg's success. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, uh, after her father died. It turns out that her younger brother, Bobby, had an inner ear infection that was chronic, and he almost died. He ended up with infection, and they had to actually bore holes into his eardrums with little glass tubes to drain out infection. And he nearly died uh, as a fever from the bacteria in there, uh, brewing in his brain. And the doctor said to the family, you have to take this kid to a warmer climate. Well, all these people knew was, you know... Um, uh, entertainment and uh, you know mostly stage work, so it made sense to them to come out to Hollywood, uh, specifically Beechwood Canyon out here by where the Hollywood sign is now, because you know most of the time you know uh, ten months out of the year it's dry and most of the time it's um, you know dry heat, and it also afforded him you know uh, the ability to do work because he had connections here. Because um, there was the stage was still uh, pretty well in vogue here, and then of course films were making a, a real big monumental um, foothold. So they ended up coming out here, and he bought the little house in Beechwood Canyon, and they already had some family out here on Jane's side of the family, the, uh, the stepmother Loretta, and then her sister Jane. And so in 19, at the end of 1922, uh, early 23, excuse me, they came out here and they bought the house. And then later that summer is when they started building the uh, Hollywood land sign. But Peg hadn't started acting professionally yet on stage. She was going to some um, theater schools in Hollywood and she was mostly reading plays and going to plays and rehearsing um, scenes. Uh, acting out scenes with uh, her aunt, who had now retired to be a full-time mother to Peg's two younger brothers and her. And it's not until Peg turned 17, and they had gone back east to visit uh, Ross family members in Ohio. And at this time, her uncle was working for the A1 uh, Shakespearean actor of the day, um, named Walter uh, Hampton. And Walter Hampton, he was best friends with Ethel Barrymore, and he was the A-list Shakespearean uh, on Broadway. And at a party, a birthday party for Walter Hampton, Peg, she's 17, and she's getting ready to, you know, have her coming out. And she meets at this party uh, uh, a, a man who uh, was going to start the... Uh, Boston Repertory, a man named Henry Jewett, and he was introduced to Peg, and she knew all about him, and through this conversation at this party, he became really intrigued with her, and he was still putting together a uh, repertory company for the theater that was to open later that October, and Peg had a bed she was supposed to bunk. She got accepted by the brand new Theater Guild School of Acting. You see, and there's this, there's another kind of error, a very innocent one, where it says Peg graduated from the Theater Guild School of New York. She didn't actually graduate. She had been accepted, and she was supposed to um, go there and uh, spend eight months um, learning the craft. And uh, her bunkmate was going to be a girl named Sylvia Sidney, who became a you know, very well-known character actress through the years. 
Um, but what happened instead was when she met Henry Jewett, Henry Jewett offered her a contract right then and there. And a few months later, Peg is at the Boston Repertory um, performing professionally, and she stays there the next eight months. And that's where she has her really big success. And she becomes the toast of Boston. And she becomes Boston's most popular actress, and she becomes the youngest member of a repertory company in the United States. Um, you know, and it's a it's an equity ruled repertory company, and it was there that her her tra- and she did all of Shaw, she did all of Ibsen, she did a little bit of Shakespeare, which she didn't really like all that, and she you know she did a little bit of uh, O'Neill. Uh, Ibsen, uh, Ibsen was her favorite, and Shaw was her most challenging. But it's her biggest success first comes when she's 17, uh, and she does uh, Ibsen's The Wild Duck. And that was the night in January 1926, just before Peg turned 18, uh, where a young girl named Betty Davis sat in the front row with her mother and saw this magnificent performance and you, you see in my book that all the quotes I have from about Peg and Twistle from Betty Davis are taken directly from Betty's own words in her own memoirs and uh, interviews first person interviews and one thing about another thing about Peg in Boston was they did a lot of outdoor theater too and you know in the like one Christmas, the theme was Snow White. And on the Boston Common, there's thousands of people on the Boston Common, and they all come out in this big community uh, Christmas Eve party, and Peg had been starring in Snow White at the repertory, and they let her run around uh, all over the Boston Common that night with the children singing songs from the Snow White uh, play, and she's dressed as Snow White. And she just had a marvelous time, and uh, it really fed her ego. But she, you know what? She was really very good. Mm. Well, so that's where she has her, yeah. You know, Betty Davis being one of the great uh, actresses of of all time, uh, when when she said something like uh, Peg Entwistle was her was her personal favorite actress, uh, obviously uh, Peg was. Phenomenal, because <laughs> that's that's an amazing that's an amazing anecdote that it inspired her to her to pursue her own acting career. Yeah, you know, Jamie, I I'm I'm doing research, and you know, and and I was about I don't know, I was still about two years away from submitting the manuscript, and you know, right now the databases are a lot better than when I started the project. But most of the time, I had to go on microfilm and look at magazines and go to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science archives, or the archives here where I'm speaking to you from at UCLA, and and actually flip old magazines page at a time or scroll microfilm a page at a time and look for theatrical notes and use hunches like a detective might use a hunch to follow up on leads. And I would find these little bits and pieces of Peg's career because it just wasn't put all together in one spot for me to copy and paste. I had a literally, the research for the book was unprecedented. Um, Her family didn't have this stuff. And, you know, I find it was um, a 1976 November, and it was almost exactly 50 years after Betty Davis had seen Peg perform in The Wild Duck. And she was giving an interview for Newsday, and she's talking to the Newsday reporter, Al Cohn, and it's, a, it's about a quarter-page article uh, or interview, and she replies to him in bold. And the last question of the interview in this Newsday, almost exactly 50 years after Betty first saw Peg, Al Cohn, he asked the last question, which is, were there any actresses after whom you patterned yourself? And she says, one. And you could just see Betty Davis, you know, that flamboyant with a cigarette flying in the air. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. And just, she says, one. 
peg and twist. You know, and she goes on to talk a lot. And I actually almost began to weep because I thought, because I had never seen this before. And I knew that Betty had been influenced by Peg because I read Betty's three, Betty wrote three autobiographies, but only the first two does she mention Peg. The third one is really about her and her daughter and has nothing to really do about entertainment or film or stage. But in her first two memoirs, Betty does talk a lot about Peg. And, and I thought, and I already knew that, and I used all those quotes in my book, you know, but I see this thing 50 years later and I went, oh my God, 50 years have gone by a half a century. And here's Betty, the great Betty Davis, still giving all the credit to Peg Entwistle. Yeah. You know, she for stayed, she, Peg, Peg stayed with her that long. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Um, I just have a couple more more questions for you. Um, mm-hmm. If if because the the the, um, the information that you always read and and you cleared that up with with her not really having big dreams of Hollywood success that her passion lie in the stage more than anything. But mm-hmm. how severely was her role cut from Thirteen Women and and how did what effect did that have on her? Well, they originally, because I did find, um, it was in two separate archives at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in their archive. I found all the inner office memos and uh, many uh, production reports. And then at UCLA um, was the other half of production reports for this one film, 13 Women. And also here were the shooting scripts, the original draft, the original shooting script, communications from the RKO office in New York to uh, David O. Selznick and George Cooker, as well as correspondence between RKO, Selznick, and representatives of the Hayes office, you know, the uh, MPAA, the production code, the censors. And put, it took me a while to put it together because it was very confusing. It was very convoluted because I had no clue what I was doing until and it took a few months when I laid it all out because there's no original print existing anymore. The print, the only print existing is, uh, it was about an hour long. Originally the film was one hour and 57 minutes and Peg opens the first 22 minutes of the original film as it was shot. And in it, she plays a uh, woman who's married to a, to a fellow who seems nice enough, but a little domineering. And as Myrna Loy is tooling around, um, getting her revenge against all these girls who were cruel to her in college because she was a um, mixed race. Um, you know, Peg ends up getting um, uh, seduced by an older woman, and she, an older woman, and she becomes a lesbian. And of course, this creates problems. It was very racy. There's a scene in there where they have Peg waking up in a bed after a parent lovemaking session which is indicated strongly in the script, in the shooting script, and matches all the production reports. Um, and this is, leads up to the murder of her husband, where Peg murders her husband and then goes insane uh, in the film. And 22 minutes were then whittled to 16, and then the 16 were cut even further to four. So when you see the film today, you see little more than a cameo appearance. Her cousin Helen told me that when it was done, the original shooting, and Peg had the original 22 and then even the 16, that she thought it was the best acting that she had ever done in her life up to that point. Hmm. And today, all you have is a little cameo. And it crushed Peg that it had been chopped up. And today, the film looks convoluted, and it makes no sense, and it looks like an awful film. But if you... If you read the entire script the way it was shot, it, it would have been one of the blockbusters of that season. There's no question, and it destroyed her. It, it, it crushed her. It really did. Wouldn't it be something if that footage were were still in existence somewhere? Uh, the, oh, the footage that they cut. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would hope. You know, I mean, I, I looked around hard, and uh, but it doesn't seem to be because. 
Um, there was a lot of problems. When you look at all the letters I found, all these um, inner office memos going back and forth between Cooker and Selznick and the Hayes office and uh, Will Hayes' representative out here um, to the uh, what was called the Studio Relations Committee, which was like the Hollywood branch of the Washington, D.C. headquarters for the, uh, uh, for the Hayes office. And, you know, word got out. Um, first of all, they keep warning um, Selznick, you know, you cannot have this lesbian affair in the film. And there's one interesting, um, and I was, I'm glad I caught it. Back in the 1920s, there was a stage play called The Captive. And it was a Mae West uh, produced show. And in fact, uh, Mary Phillips, who was Bogart's wife, was in it. And um, uh, uh, it, it was a story about, about lesbians. And it got raided by the police. <laughs> and, and all the actors went to jail. And uh, so there's a memo I have regarding Peg's film, her only film, where she's playing this lesbian, and uh, the Hayes office representative tells Selznick that you can't have the captive element of this film. And, of course, he has the captive in all caps, uppercase, which tells me, oh, that was a title. And I was able to put it together. Oh, I see what he's doing. What he's doing is he's firing a shot across the bow. He's saying you have to get rid of this lesbian love scene and find some other way for Peg and Twistle to murder her husband. <laughs> mm. Because apparently it's okay if you're a straight woman and you murder your husband, but it's yes. appalling if you're a, if you're a lesbian murdering, uh, you know, your husband. So, uh, it, the, the film, I think it would have been, uh, in fact, I'll tell you what, I found a, uh, I, I found a press release from RKO, and they had planned on doing, um, uh, I believe it was, 11 pitchers that year. And out of the 11, the top three were uh, included 13 women. And mm. uh, that was in the top three. And it was one of the largest budgets. I mean, Cedric Gibbons did the sets. Uh, Max Steiner did the, did the uh, music. I mean, and those are names that today, I mean, Cedric Gibbons, I mean, that's the guy who who did the ruby slippers for The Wizard of Oz. And, you know, so the film had a lot of prestige attached to it. George Cooker, of course, was going to helm it. And, um, you know, it ended up going at, uh, to a guy named Archibald, which is fine. But there was a lot of promise for this film, and Peg was very excited. She had been crestfallen already because they ended up giving her her role from Bill of Divorcement. Um, she was on a short list, and they ended up giving it, of course, we know Catherine Hepburn and made her a star. And, um, I, you know, I think Peg was crushed. Catherine Hepburn had never done a film, but she had only done three plays. And Peg had been on stage for seven years and had been in hundreds of plays up to that point and had performed in front of hundreds of thousands of people in her seven years. So she was quite the veteran. She was very good. I didn't find a single bad review. I found maybe, oh, I don't know, thousands of reviews from different periodicals. And even when Peg's plays would stink, when they were bombed, uh, she was still spoken of uh, quite highly. There's not a single bad review to be found uh, regarding Peg Entwistle. Mm. And it, it it really crushed her to, uh, you know, have her film chopped and whittled. And, you know, the film, it became, they chopped it up. They didn't just chop up her part. You know, they removed the storylines of three added actresses. You know, so 13 women originally was 11 women that got chopped down to eight women. And now you actually only see, um, you know, six. <laughs> you know, and they hurry those through. Yeah, yeah. it's a very I mean, fuzzy math. It sounds like a very kind of brazen, uh, you know, potentially incendiary project. That that movie. I mean, just, um, but, oh, it it was, yeah, it was. Um, she was she was the original lesbian psycho um, of Hollywood. You know, yeah. if they kept this story all the way through, and you know, if you've seen the film, um, 
and you see the the opening part. You see Peg, you know, holding hands as she is sitting in the circus, and after she talks to her old school chums, um, and then the scene shows her with this kind of older, you know, matronly kind of, almost like a Marie Dressler type of woman, and um, you know, and that's that was the woman who played her lesbian lover in the film, mm. and. Uh, uh, it, I, I thought I, I think you know the story was brilliant, and it's too bad that um, that the Puritans, who had a creative ball in their body, chopped this film up or had it chopped up. And you know, finally Selznick, you know, he capitulated to the Hayes office, uh, and Hayes came out here, I think, for a specific trip. Uh, when it was announced that Hayes was going to come out here, um, it, the newspaper said the New York Times said they quote is to set straight all of the producers who have backslid in the ways of sin. <laughs> because, you know, they started, what happened was the Hayes office was getting swapped. 200 scripts a month were coming in, and they didn't have enough people to review all the scripts and to suggest the changes, you know. So a lot of films were coming out. It was, of course, it was the coming to the end of the pre-code era, but there was an awful lot of, you know, juicy pre-code stuff coming out. And uh, I think this would have been one of the best pre-code films ever done. It had a terrific cast with Irene Dunn and Myrna Loy, uh, and Ricardo Cortez. When you look at the production values of what's remaining of this film, they're really very good. You know, terrific shots of Los Angeles, 1932. Um, and they showed a lot of the innovations of the city. Um, you had, you know, the, two, the two-way radios that were just given to the LAPD, um, the, the dispatch systems of the LAPD station. It was all very interesting stuff that had never been seen before. And it was a, I think it would have been a very, very good film. And, and, and I Peg knew it, too, and she wanted to hang around and do about three or four more films out here for the money. And I think, you know, for her resume, it would have amped her resume up quite a bit. But then things happened. Yeah. Well, and and you know, around this time too, she had a she had a, a marriage that failed uh, a few years before she died with Robert yeah. Keith, and and you know the Keith family. That's that's another uh, family that suffered tragic uh, suicides in their family. Um, it was and that marriage lasted around two years or so. Was was that a great right burden in her or in her life a great setback yes it, that crushed her too that that devastated her um the marriage lasted uh basically exactly two years because it was on their second anniversary that peg had gone and filed for divorce out here in los angeles um meeting robert keith to her see peg grew up where all these actors had all married actors so all of the married couples in her life, for the most part, were stage people. Stage people marry stage people. We see it today. You know, film people marrying film people, for the most part. And um, she wanted that. She saw it. She admired it. Um, and she desperately wanted to have this kind of almost fairy tale marriage where she could be a leading, she wanted to be like, you know, Lynn Fontaine and, and Alfred Lund, you know, who were the two most, in fact, you know, she knew them well because they all worked in the theater guild together, you know, and, she, and that's how she wanted to be. She wanted a marriage like that. She wanted to be married to a professional, to a leading man, and Robert Keith certainly fit the bill. And he had been doing very well. Um, he was living in Rudolph Valentino's Natasha Rambova design penthouse overlooking Central Park. You know, and Peg fell in love with that place. And, um, you know, she describes it in letters. And you just, you, you're pulling, when you're reading the book, and when I was re reading, researching her life, I'm pulling for Peg. I'm pulling for this marriage. I want the marriage to work. And I was always hoping, even though I know it was going to end ugly, that something would have happened, that they got back together later. And it just wasn't so. You know, he... She divorced him. He'd been beating her and pulling her hair. And, you know, uh, while they were on tour with the Theater Guild during a national tour. And it crumbled. It crushed her. And she, but she, 
She was strong. She kept that British stiff upper lip, if you will, and she pressed on. And uh, she did very well in the stage in spite of what was going on with her marriage. And then she came to Los Angeles at the one of the last legs of the Theater Guild tour, and there's Robert Keith. He had been fired by the Guild, blacklisted from Broadway for a year or so. So he'd been working in San Francisco and doing small non-equity theater out here. And he shows up drunk at the uh, at the theater in downtown Los Angeles and um, embarrasses her and frightens the rest of the troupe. And um, she ends up having a talk with him and tells him that while she does care about him and loves him, she's not in love with him and it just can't work. But it killed her. And then in the end, you know, he ends up meeting another uh, woman, an actress in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, Peg is following, you know, they all follow e each other's careers. And Peg is reading about the success he's having. And, you know, she had spent thousands and thousands of dollars on this guy, getting him out of jail, paying his child support. You know, she marries him. She doesn't even know he has a son, you know, who became, of course, you know, Brian Keith, the actor. And, you know, in her last days, you know, one of the rungs on her ladder was... I found the newspaper articles that were from the San Francisco Chronicle and the Los Angeles papers, all of them, in the theatrical sections, announcing that Robert Keith and his actress Dorothy Tierney have sold plays, and they're working together, these two, have sold a play to Booth Tarkington, who at that time was, you know, a well-known author and playwright. And, you know, so... She is seeing what she wanted in her marriage. She's seeing it happen with this guy in San Francisco. And, and that just, I know that crushed her. She's, you know, she's a 24-year-old kid. Yeah. She may be experienced and she may be a veteran of the stage, but, you know, she didn't have any calluses on her heart yet. Her heart was still tender and she had a lot of feelings and, you know, and uh, the men who were interested in her all seemed to be married. She dated Humphrey Bogart, um, but he was married. You know, Romney Brent, she liked the playwright, but, you know, he was married. So her love life wasn't success. Um, she didn't have a lot of success with that. And, 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 and she and really, truly... Like but, but mm -hmm. you were saying you were saying that at one point Robert Keith was blacklisted from from Broadway, um, right? But the same the same happened to uh, to Peg later, didn't it? Yeah, but it, yes, it did. It was when she was out here. Now remember, now be, before all that, um, you know, Peg is in uh, New York. Robert Keith is in San Francisco, and he's got his new wife, and he's doing his thing. And Peg is doing her thing. She's very busy. She's she's working pretty steadily, and she's doing fine. And she gets a uh, she has one flop, and uh, William Brady uh, hires her, and he was one of the big big shot callers of Broadway in that day. Uh, he was the father of Alice Brady who you may know of, uh, who was a great character actress, won Academy Award for My Man Godfrey. Um, so uh, William A. Brady, he tells Peg that uh, he's going to put her in a play with uh, Lorette Taylor, who I said earlier was one of the queens of Broadway. You had this like trinity of queens, Ethel Barrymore, Billy Burke, and Lorette Taylor. And Lorette Taylor had come out of retirement after four years um, after her husband had died. Now, Peg assumed her stage name, Peg, after seeing Lorette Taylor in a play called Peg of My Heart. And uh, it was this lovable character that young girls just loved Lorette Taylor's role in Peg of My Heart. And, you know, this young English girl, Millicent Lillian Entwistle, decides to call herself Peg after this character. So now she's going to be on stage. She's going to play the daughter of Lorette Taylor in a James Berry revival of Alice Sit by the Fire. And this is going to be a smash hit. 
The tickets were sold six months in advance. It would look to have every indication of lasting two years on Broadway, which would have been a record for Peg on Broadway because uh, her longest Broadway run was in her big smash breakout hit, Tommy. Uh, this is the time when she had been married to, when she married Robert Key, or uh, yeah, Robert Key. And um, the problem is that Lorette Taylor was a periodic alcoholic. And, you know, she was one of these girls, these great actresses. I mean, she was just a gentle soul to everyone. But she just, she couldn't control her drinking at night. And there, she started not showing up. The old story uh, is that Peg came to Hollywood after a series of flops. Now, my book completely uh, debunks all of that. And you see that there, she didn't have a series of flops. And that the reason, you know, the her last Broadway outing closed uh, had nothing to do with the production value of the, of the show. It was the tickets sold out six months in advance. They were going to do about a two-year run on Broadway. Then they were going to talk. Then they had talk of taking it to England for a year and then coming back and traveling to the United States and then possibly adapting it to the screen. So there were lots of big plans for Peg with Lorette Taylor, and they got along famously with each other. And this play was amazing. The, the reviews are just phenomenal. And, but Lorette Taylor, she stops showing up, or she's showing up drunk, too drunk to work. And uh, they tried to accommodate her, but it wasn't working. They, um, so they ended up uh, pulling it. It went dark. So Peg was out of a job. Now, at this time, out here was a playwright, a friend of Peg's from the theater guild named Romney Brent. And Romney Brent came out here, as you probably know, you don't try out a Broadway show in Broadway in New York. You take it to Maine. Skowhegan is where Peg used to do a lot of her pre-Broadway tryouts or you come out here to the coast. So Brent came out here to the coast with a producer named Bella Blau, and they got together with uh, uh, two other producers out here, and um, they were going to do a two-week tryout of this comedy called The Mad Hopes. And they had signed Billy Burke, who was living here in Santa Monica. Flo Zickfield was still alive. And they saw, and then, of course, Humphrey Bogart, who was you know, coming up. He'd done a lot of Warner Brothers stuff, and uh, he wasn't quite the Warner, he wasn't quite the Bogart of Casablanca, but he was enough to that when he signed to do this pre-Broadway show, it made all the sheets across the country. Mm -hmm. So you had, and you had Billy Burke. Now, what they needed was uh, Ingenue to play Billy Burke's daughter in this lighthearted comedy, and to be the love interest for Humphrey Bogart who was quite a handsome man in 1932. Um, you know, he got kind of he, rugged looks, Eric, but you could almost say that he was almost pretty, uh, you know, in 32, 31, 32. And what happened was, you know, they put an audition uh, out, and you had, now this is Hollywood. It's the height of the Depression, 1932. I found that there were 2,000 actresses listed with, um, central casting out here who all fit the look and the general experience that Peg had. If you wanted a young blonde ingenue, you wanted a, you know, a delicate feminine girl to play the ingenue, to, you know, there were over 2000 of them out of work here. And I don't know how many auditioned, but they auditioned for two weeks and they couldn't find a suitable one because they were either, you know, starstruck by Billy Burke or they tried to upstage Billy Burke. So what happened was the, um, uh, the two other producers here, uh, 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 Belasco and Coran, uh, David Belasco and Homer Coran, um, they asked Romney Brent, you know, they remembered when Peg was out here four years earlier with the theater guild and they had seen her and they, and they remembered Peg. So they asked Brent, they knew she, he and she were friends, ask if Peg Entwistle is available because we know that her show with Lorette Taylor went dark. So to give you an idea 
Because it's one thing to say, well, Betty Davis credited Peg and Twistle, okay, to become Betty Davis. That's one thing. But then the creme de la creme to me is, it's inconceivable to me at the height of the Great Depression when theatrical producers are in film land, okay, because this is Hollywood. It's all about the film, even in 1932. So if you're a theatrical producer doing a play, which is only going to run two weeks because it's a pre-Broadway tryout, it's inconceivable to me that you can't find an actress out here suitable enough to play Billy Burke's daughter for this supporting role. And yet, what they do is they call New York and they ask Peg, and she doesn't recite a single line. She doesn't audition for them. They remember her from four years earlier, and they hire her on the spot over the phone and then pay not only her first-class train ticket out here, but they pay for another actor. They fire an actor in the show, promising him that they will give him another role in another show somewhere, a better one, so they can hire an actor recommended by Peg so she can have a male escort on the train so she doesn't have to be on the train all alone, this pretty young 24-year-old girl. Hmm. And to me, that speaks volumes to the, the, the talent that was Peg Entwistle. You know, and they come out here, and this show, when it opened, it was like a Hollywood premiere at Grauman's. They had the big spotlights out. They had the red carpet. They had, it was live broadcast on the radio. Um, it was a black tie affair. All of this, you know, for a pre-Broadway tryout, you know, because you Flo Zickfield was there. All of the Hollywood A-list was there. It was, you know, all the names were there. John Gilbert was there. Uh, you know, all, Garbo was there. All the names of the legendary Hollywood showed up to see this show that was essentially just a pre-Broadway tryout. And, <clears throat> you know, that really, to me, shows me that Peg and Twistle was something really special mm -hmm. when it came to that stage. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you've, you've given me so much time, um, and I really appreciate it. I'm sorry, I didn't expect to take this much time, but, you know, you, you, you've done such a great service for Peg because you've brought her back to life for all of us. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a sacred thing. So I, I want to thank you for that, and thank you for all the time you give me. But I, I just have two more questions. I'll take the um, as long as you want. I'm, I'm here. I love talking about Peg. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm serious. Whatever, I'll, you know, you can you can edit it all out later. I don't care what you do. Just you no, know, no, no. I want I, I, I want to do justice to Peg as well, and 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 you're obviously the key to that. Um, tell me about <clears throat> you spoke to her, her brother and her cousin. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, you know, I I know you took years and years to research this, uh, during which time you you spoke to them. Uh, either one of them still alive to to see to see your book? Uh, they they did see the book. Helen passed away recently, um, uh, about a month after the book came out. Um, I, I sent her a copy. Uh, now Helen was a real hoot. She was she was nine, as I said earlier. She was about nineteen. She wouldn't give me her age. And I was guessing that she was um, she was in her uh, at least in her 90s because um, she was about four years four or five years older than Peg's brother. I knew that, and she was a couple years. Cause she, what she told me was, I was, I'm a few years younger than Peg, and she spent about the first part of the day of Peg's last day on Earth, and um, and she gave me lots of insights. And she was with Peg most of the last two weeks of Peg's life. So she actually had more, she was living in St. Louis, um, and so we only spoke by phone, and she was living in a, um, in a convalescent home, and she was just so sweet, and uh, I'm almost ready to, I'm almost, <clears throat> I have to compose myself. She was just one of those, you know, truly of the greatest generation, Yeah. and I would hear, uh, she'd be telling me about Peg, and then I would hear, you know, like a, PA announcement, and I'd say, what's that? And she said, oh, honey, I have to go because it's time for um, uh, Martini Bingo. 
<laughs> you know, I thought, yeah, I thought, oh my God, isn't that the coolest thing? You know, there's no. Yeah. I says, oh, you, you know. So she would go and play her. Mar- they would have a martini, a real martini, and play bingo. And uh, these wonderful stories. Um, now her brother, um, he's still alive. Um, but he's not doing so well. I had the great fortune of um, when I located him, which was purely by accident. Because I honestly, I didn't think any of them were alive. I did a, um, um, I just did a kind of a, a quick search, and but there's so many Entwistles, and they always kept coming back to John Entwistle of the Who, you know, and <laughs> uh, and no relation, by the way. And I get asked that a lot. Uh, well, you know, they're yeah, all all yeah. the Entwistles are related, but you have to go back to the 14th century. <laughs> Which is also so, ironic because because her her biggest hit was Tommy. So uh, so you'd think, hey, maybe maybe it is related to the Who somehow. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah. You know, in fact, you know, McFarland, the editor, the publisher, you know, the uh, an editor at McFarland said, uh, what we're going to need from you is uh, in the opening chapter, we're going to need a description of how the Entwistle name came to be and what it means. And I was like, what? What's like that? <laughs> but they wanted it in there. They insisted. So, you know, the name originally means, um, you know, the uh, r- the place where the ducks drink their water or <laughs> some silly thing, uh, uh, you know, any, any a twistle. And um, there's a fork in the river where the ducks gather. So, uh, yeah, so they're related. But that is ironic. Yeah, Tommy and then Tommy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, that was just a joke. Are, I realize I realize the play no, that she did is it, is it based on the Who? <laughs> well, you, you know what the, the the ironic twists and and they're throughout they're woven throughout my book. The ironic twists in Peg Entwistle's life are just astounding at times. Now, I, it's easy to reach for things. I understand that, but as I was looking at this, you know, and putting it all together, uh, it just the, the way things came to be. Uh, was just truly amazing. Um, you know, uh, you know when they rebuilt the Hollywood sign, oh, I, I, I'm kind of shooting ahead. What happened was uh, when I contacted, I was working as a researcher on a film, on a documentary called Under the Hollywood Sign for a, uh, uh, a filmmaker named Hope Anderson who lives out here in Beechwood Canyon out by the sign. And uh, her and I, we ended up, you know, getting together as a result of me seeing a trailer for her documentary called Peg and Twistle's Last Walk, which is a dramatization uh, of, of Peg's walk to the Hollywood sign with this haunting music and, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a little bit of narration. And uh, so that's how I met this Hope Anderson. And so um, she took me on as a researcher. And at the same time, I'm doing research for her. I'm also helping my project. And that's how I found Peg's brother through there. And so Milton, um, he, uh, he, he was thrilled. He says, wow, I didn't think that my sister's story, you know, would be worth having a book. I said, I said, Milton, you'd be surprised. You know, I mean, I get emails from all over the world, literally. I mean, I'm having to have to do Google translating, Poland, Russia, Japan, France, you know, right now, one of the most popular songs in Paris is uh, Peg et mon nom, which is Peg is my name. And it's this beautiful song by uh, Camille Saillon and a man named uh, Benoit Claire, who uh, they sing this ballad. Uh, and it's uh, about Peg and Twistle standing on the Hollywood sign before she jumps, wondering if the world will remember her. <laughs> you know, and I don't understand a word of French except ooh la la. And I learned that from Dean Martin. Okay, I'm watching Dean Martin. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and uh, I listen to this song and I weep, and I don't understand a word of French. And yet, so Milton, he says, well, I'll tell you what, Can you? I'm up in Santa Cruz. Can you come out to Santa Cruz? I said, Milton, I'll go, I don't, I'll go to Pluto. He says, because we have boxes in the garage that haven't been opened in about 75 years, and you'll have to talk to my daughter about it because she knows more about what's in the boxes than I do, but it's all like related to my sister. Wow. I get on a train the next day, and Milton is gracious enough to let me stay at his home for 
about two weeks, and I'm I listen to all the stories and you know and going through the boxes and the photographs and uh, the stories and uh, you know they have these old receipts that are in pristine condition when they did work on the house and I'm flipping through these receipts because they with the house on Beachwood Canyon that's still there and it's a tourist attraction. You know, they, they, the tourist vans go right by, and here's your house of uh, Peg and Twistle, the Hollywood sign girl. You know, and everyone's ooh, ah. And I took one of these uh, tours um, anonymously. Oh, sorry about the helicopter. No, that's all right. Uh, it's not mine, and it's not the Army. Okay, we're good. Um, so she says, um, uh, uh, well, Milton said, excuse me, that uh, he might be interested in these. These are receipts from when um, my uncle bought the house. And I'm looking at these receipts, and all of a sudden I notice the date on the receipts. And this is from a contractor, and he's itemized all these plumbing fittings. And then another contractor and another set of receipts that has all uh, carpentry pieces. And another one for kitchen tile and flooring and all these itemized, and I look at the dates, and they're all July and August, September in 1923. And because I know the area, I happen to know also about the history of Hollywood, that the Hollywood Land sign, they started building it in late summer, and it was finally finished and dedicated in November of 1923, which means that Peg and Twistle was sitting on her point, and I, so I spoke to her aunt about these receipts. Uh, I mean, excuse me, her cousin. And I said, Helen, I got all these receipts, blah, 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 and I know that you and your mom and your dad, you live in the house next door. Can you tell me about... So one thing leads to another, and we find out that one day, Peg was on her porch at the Beachwood Drive home, and it's the only road at that time in and out towards where you see now the Hollywood sign. And there was no Hollywood Land sign there. It was just a mountainside, Mount Lee. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, Peg got really angry because she's trying to rehearse a role, and there's all these big bulldozers and tractors and these men and trucks hauling up all these big telephone poles and braces and pieces of steel. And they were heading up to the hill to begin construction on the Hollywood Land sign. And I come to find out, so Peg not only sees the Hollywood sand, Hollywood Land sign, why? But then later, her and her adventurous friends and her brother, they used to go up and they used to climb it. So here's Peg, you know, and I just, my heart, like, skipped. I went, oh, the irony of this. Mm-hmm. So when Peg climbed that sign on her last night on Earth, I mean, she knew exactly where to go. She knew exactly, you know, where the ladders were how to scale it, how to get up there, because she had done it lots of times. Her brother told me all us kids used to climb the sign. It was the only thing. You could either climb the sign or you go up and you ride the horses up at the stable, at Beachwood Stables, uh, or you had to go downtown to uh, Hollywood. And most of us couldn't go downtown because, uh, you know, they wouldn't let us go without our parents. And, uh, you know, it's, Mm. it's just the irony that, you know, Peg, she sees this magnificent sign being built, you know, and um, and she ends her life and dies in front of it, you know. So, and, uh, the, but the family you know, was very gracious. Hmm? Was was her was her cousin? Um, was she was she haunted by by her? By Peg's death, I mean, did that? Oh, did sure, they, they all were. They were, yeah. You know, it it just it devastated them. And it, it, she described it like this, and um, it got taken out of the the, the editor at McFarland. Um, they removed it uh, against my insistence that it stay. Um, it had something to do with some. I think they thought I was trying to reach for a, uh, because I had used the word haunted. But that's not what I meant. I know what you mean by haunted. You're talking about the memory, the psychological effect. Yeah. You know, and I kept trying to tell my editor, and he said, oh, you can't use the word haunted in that book because people are going to think you're speaking paranormal. And blah, blah. 
No, she, in fact, it was like this, that the, the family was so devastated that they literally ignored it. They ignored it. Peg was cremated, and then they just put her ashes in a closet and to put the urn in the closet, and nobody was allowed to talk about her. Nobody was allowed to talk about it for several years. You know, she didn't get put into the ground, uh, her remains, uh, which were buried with her, her dad and the stepmom Loretta in Ohio uh, until the following January. And, um, you know, everybody knew that Peg was in dire straits, that her depression was real. You know the story that it says, you know, and after Peg died, you know, a letter arrived offering her a part yes. in a stage yes. play where she was to play a woman who kills herself. Well, that didn't happen at all. But what did happen was even more interesting. And and I don't know how that story began about the letter. I think somewhere along, her brother seems to think, and the cousin agreed, that sometime years ago, perhaps in the 50s, when the term Hollywood sign girl started to take on its own kind of life in regards to Peg, that someone had aspirations. They either were doing a book or they were doing an article. Um, Milton vaguely remembered a writer, a female writer, but he couldn't remember who. He didn't remember was it for a book or a newspaper or TV show, um, interviewed the younger brother, Bobby who had already died by the time I met Milton. And he believes that, um, that Bobby mentioned a letter. Now the letter that comes, which I mentioned in the book, of course, is the letter that was mailed by Peg's grandmother, uh, who was in New Mexico visiting other family members at the time. And she writes this letter And it has general things. There's some family gossip in it. And then she's wondering how Peg's brothers are doing. And she's writing this letter to Jane Ross, Peg's aunt, at the Beechwood house here. And now Peg's nickname, her lifelong nickname was Babs, which is odd because normally you associate Babs with Barbara. But I believe it was because Peg saw a play um, with a uh, character named Babby. And she liked that. And that's about when she started calling herself Babs. And she signs her letters Babs. The family refers to her as Babs. <clears throat> and so the grandmother says, I'm so sorry to hear about Babs, meaning that she got let go by RKL. And I hope before this letter arrives that she gets a, a contract, another contract somewhere, and that she'll be all set. Tell her not to give up. There's always a better day ahead. You know, tomorrow is always a better day. And that's all she has. And it's a two-page letter. And she mails this on the day that Peg jumped to her death. You know, it's dated and it's postmarked September 16th, 1932. And when I first read that, I just want, you know, oh, the, the irony of this. Here's this woman writing a letter. You know, and the letter is on its way here as Peg is walking up to the Hollywood sign to kill herself. Yeah. And, you know, she just didn't want to hang on another day. She just had too much. She couldn't handle it. Do you think, do you, do you think it was, do, do you think it was something that was in Peg's mind prior to that day, or do you think it was a spontaneous decision to jump off the sign? I I think it was, at that time, it was spontaneous. Um, uh, She was seen, um, she told her family she was going to meet friends. All the indications are that she did meet the friends. Um, And then something happened, and we, nobody will ever know what exactly happened. It's my belief that she was sitting at the Hollywood Land Cafe, which is still there. Um, and in fact, they have Peg's picture in the window next door in a little antique shop. You know, the, the one where uh, from my cover, my book cover, mm-hmm. with Peg's chin in her hand. Um, a friend of mine, he did a colorized version of that. 
and somebody gave that to uh, the, the so it, so you go through Hollywood Land Village today and you see Peg's photo, this colorized photo a friend of mine did uh, all through there, and um, as kind of a kind of a tribute to her, and I believe that she uh, she probably read something. She was always reading the trade papers. And like I said, you know, there was news out about her ex-husband and he had just did this big film, uh, excuse me, uh, sold a play to Booth Tarkington and he's living large in San Francisco and she's flat broke and she's blacklisted from Broadway. And even if she, she had the nerve to borrow money, she could have borrowed money, but she didn't want to put other people on the spot. Um, she could have gotten, uh, gone back to New York or a smaller town near New York, and maybe Hartford. They knew her in Hartford. They knew her in Maine. They knew her in Boston. Um, but she couldn't get the money to go to any of those places because she just didn't want to. She had too much of an ego, and she just would not like to borrow money from anybody, and she never did. She was very giving when she had it, and she gave money to everybody. Um, she constantly gave money to her. Uh, you know, her brother St. Peg, always, she was sending money to us all the time, and we didn't even need it. She just kept sending it. And she's always bailing out Robert Keith and giving money to her friends. And I think what happened was, now she was in need, and no one was offering her, and she had too much of an ego. She was she had too much pride to ask somebody for money. And I believe what happened was that she took all of the items she had in her purse because none of these items were found. Uh, you know, women carry stuff in their purse, lipstick, mm -hmm. you know, makeup kit, a little mirror, you know, hairbrushes, you know, girl stuff. None of that was found. The only thing that was in her purse was the suicide note. So I believe that she emptied on threw away all the things personal to her in her purse the things that would make her look pretty, to make her feel feminine, to make her feel like a girl, like a woman. And she writes this note, and she doesn't sign it Peg and Twistle, and she doesn't sign it Peg. She signs it P.E. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of play a little bit of psychology, because it's I believe that the reason that she signed it P.E. was so that it would help the authorities identify her because she knew how it worked out here. She knew that when they found her body, they would find the note and that her family would know who P.E. was when they read a description. That's exactly what happened. And, but she disassociated herself. You know, it makes sense to me that someone would have signed the letter Peg or signed it Peg and Twistle. But she signs it P.E. She wants to disassociate herself from herself to make it easier for her to make her pain go away once and for all. Um, and yeah, I believe it was spontaneous. I don't believe she was planning it. Now, I will tell you that I open up the second section of my book, Act Two, um, with a poem that was written to Peg um, in 1929, by a New York socialite that she knew uh, while she was doing Tommy, by a lady named Al, Cap Al excuse me, Ann Caparn. I almost said Al Capone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah, by Ann, Ann Caparn. And, um, and it's this beautiful poem. And Peg was living here at the time. And, uh, and Peg had called Ann and um, this was shortly after her divorce on the heels of the end of the Theater Guild tour. And you see what happened was Peg loved the Theater Guild. It was her dream. You know, stage was her life. But the creme de la creme, Peg knew that she had made it when the Theater Guild asked her to be a part of their company. But now, because of all of the public embarrassment brought on by Robert Keith's drunkenness, his disruptive attitude, his violence. He got two drunk driving arrests during the tour. You know, the theater guild were very, very prim and proper. Okay. They, the women weren't, you, the women couldn't use uh, ill language. They were not allowed to gossip. You didn't smoke cigarettes in public. 
You know, they didn't care if you could smoke like a chimney, you know, in the dressing room. But when you were out in public, you represented the guild because you were the guild. You know, the men were to be gentlemen. And it was just, just this kind of thing of honor and this code of conduct. And, you know, they, they really prided themselves on this, the theater guild. And scandal was to be kept behind the doors. They knew people were human. People were going to make mistakes and screw up. But you just didn't bring this out in public. But now Robert Key's drunkenness, he's out of control, and he's disrupting performances. He's abusing Peg. He's physically abusive. He's hitting her. He's threatening other members of the troop. Um, and so they fire him, and they blacklist him. And then when this year-long tour ends, all of the other 35 members, almost every single one of them got a contract from the guild. Yeah, They didn't give her anything. No contract. And I know why. I don't have anything written down, but I know the history of the guild. I studied it for the book. I know the history of all the founders of the guild. I know how they were. These people were almost Puritans. They were, you know, teetotalers. And the thing is, it wasn't that they didn't like Peg. And they certainly knew that she was a good actress. They certainly knew that, right? Because the reviews across the country are phenomenal. I mean, uh, she stands out above everybody. But it was because they couldn't take the chance that Robert Keith would still continue to stalk her. And they just couldn't bring this anymore. One of the other things that happened was Peg had an abortion. And I found this letter uh, where she describes the abortion. And as I mentioned in the book that, uh, you know, back then, uh, you know, doctors were getting 25 years to life in prison if one of their patients died on a table. And women inducing medications, like today we call it the morning after pill, but in New York at that time, that was a, a, a Class C felony, and they were giving mothers four years in prison if they took what they called inducing medications. And abortion was so abhorrent in New York State at that time that the New York Times didn't even use the word abortion. They called it an illegal operation or an illegal medical procedure, and everybody knew that it meant an abortion. But the New York papers would not use that word. So Peg has an abortion. Because she hates children, because she believes that children would only slow her down. And she writes in these letters that I have quoted in the book, you know, she's positively rabid on the subject. She wouldn't be a mother for any man, no matter what. You know, she says she would rather see her name in the lights on a marquee on Broadway than to be in a lit college, in a lit cottage home, you know, with rugrats running around. (laughs) And she becomes almost this kind of, Uh, it wasn't that she hated kids because she loved her brothers, but it was the fear of motherhood, you see. And that would, of course, go back, I believe, to when uh, Loretta died and Peg's dreams to become a a stage actress died because her father had to work, and now it was up to her to raise her two little baby brothers. Her little baby brother Bobby was uh, three years old, And her brother was six years old, her older brother, Milton. And these English, back then, they didn't believe in a nanny unless you were, like, you know, living in Buckingham. Um, You know, if you were royalty, you had a nanny. But, uh, you know, the working class, you know, Peg was expected to look after her brothers until her father, you know, remarried. And uh, and Peg didn't think that was ever going to happen. She thought that she would forever be a mother to a surrogate mother to her brothers. And I think that's where originally it set in that being a mother now is that she's an adult would interfere with her acting career, her life. You know, yeah. the thing that she was born to do, walk the boards of Broadway. And, you know, she, she didn't stop to pay attention that the greatest actresses of the day, Ethel Barrymore, Maud Adams, Mrs. Uh, 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 Ethel Barrymore, Lorette Taylor, uh, Billy Burke, they all had children. They were juggling their career and their family. So it could have been done, but Peg didn't see it that way. She was stubborn. And uh, so one of the other things I believe happened was that the theater guild got wind that Peg had an abortion. And 
mingled. They didn't confront her on it. But between that and the and the uh, debauchery of Robert Keith and bringing the embarrassment to the guild, I think they thought, you know what? L- let's just we're not going to give Peg a contract for the next season, you know, and we're only going to stick to one play that that she has to do under the con- present contract she had. So Peg is devastated. So she's out here in Los Angeles. Fear Guild Tour is over. She's got this divorce. She's got all this fresh PTSD, the psychological trauma. Um, and, you know, she's got a lot of money. She saved up a lot of money. So she took a vacation out here. And then she got depressed. Her cousin Helen remembers the phone call to New York. And it cost $40. And that was a lot of money. That was a week's salary for most people, you know, in 1929. And she remembers Peg talking to Ann and Ann had written Peg a letter that came several days later, which included a poem, which fits the Hollywood sign to a T and which fits a woman who's climbing the sign for the specific point of committing suicide off of it. And it's a beautiful poem. It's a tragic poem, beautifully written and uh, about the wistful stares to death and, um, you know, you know, leaving this stage for another. And it's very, very poetic and very touching and moving. And I think that Peg's first ideations of suicide occurred then. And her friend Ann Caparn knew this and writes this letter. And for whatever reason, Peg snaps out of it. But that night in 1932... Uh, I don't believe she planned it when she left her house. Uh, And I believe she was just sitting at the cafe and all these things were weighing on her heavily. You know, she ends up living above the garage in the house, Uh, in the garage behind her house. There's a little room in the garage. And so Peg, when she got broke, she lost her apartment in New York. She lost all the furniture and the clothing, the jewelry that were there because she didn't have the money to pay the rent for her New York townhouse. So she lost that. She lost all the possessions that went in the storage and then got sold to pay the back rent. So she's out here with literally just a suitcase full of clothes. So she went from living in Rudolph Valentino's penthouse apartment with her, with her, um, you know, Broadway leading man overlooking Central Park and seeing the, the marquees of the Great White Way. And she writes in a letter you know, and this is the night he proposes to her, and she says to her on the letter, the stars in the sky and the balcony of Rudolph Valentino's penthouse apartment. And he proposes to me, and it was enough to make a hog romantic, and she goes on like this. And all these dreams are crushed, and they all weigh upon her heavily on the night of September 16th, 1932. And I think that she started just going for a walk, And I think she walked up to the sign, and I don't think that she actually decided to jump until she got there. I think she just wanted to go for a long walk to clear her head, and the more she walked, the more tired she became of life, of this journey. And uh, so you think so you think that she she wrote climbed up. So you think that she wrote that note. At at what time do you think she wrote that note when she had already ascended the sign yeah you know i i think she wrote it um i think she wrote it in the glow of the sign i think she wrote it in the flashing glow of the sign um you know there's there was no pen or pencil found um so i think maybe she just i don't know laid it down threw it tossed it aside but i really believe that she wrote the note there in front of the sign um and uh, you know and the, the signs were still the sign was still flashing and there was plenty of light for her to write, and it's just a quick note. And it was a mysterious note. A lot of people didn't know what the note meant. Her family didn't know what the note meant uh, until I was able to piece it together because their family didn't know about her career. And they didn't know about all the things that were going on with her career. You know, they didn't know about the broken promises. They didn't know that she had been blacklisted. They didn't know that she had been reaching out. They found one letter. They had no idea what it was. It was a letter from a producer, a theatrical producer in New York. And, you know, when I started researching this letter, 
I discover that this man's actress wife um, was running a house, a big apartment building in New York that was for out-of-work stage actresses. And it was the counterpart to what uh, uh, Agnes DeMille, Cecil B. DeMille's wife here had called the Hollywood Studio Club. The Hollywood, and today it's still here, called the Hollywood Studio Apartments, although it's not run by the YWCA anymore. But, you know, they had this uh, place out here for uh, these girls who who couldn't make it in Hollywood as an actress. And so yeah. rather than them going out and, uh, you, know, re- you know, resorting to prostitution, you know, and, you know, horrible things like that, Cecil B. DeMille's wife got together with the YWCA, formed the Hollywood Studio Club, and it was a safe environment. They gave the girls two meals. It was a girls-only place, two meals a day, run by the YWCA, and you had chaperones and rules, and the rents were cheap and often forgiven when you couldn't pay it, or they would give you money to get your way back home to, you know, Mule Shoe, Texas, or, you know, Sagebrush, Arizona, or wherever you came from. But Peg didn't want to do any of that. She had a lot of ego. She had a lot of pride. And, you know, Edward G. Robinson wrote about her five years later. Edward G. Robinson is uh, filling in for Walter Winchell in his syndicated column. And Winchell's on vacation. So Edward G. Robinson, he writes that day's article. And he talks about all these girls who come from all over to come out to Hollywood to, you know, make it big in films. And he says, you know, most of these girls don't pull a peg into us. What they do is they, they, when they fail in Hollywood, they go on to become a school teacher or a nurse or a housewife. You know, very few of them are going to jump out the window or jump off a sign. But the problem is, and Edward G., he, he was right in a lot of ways about Peg. Because as Hope Anderson pointed out to me, Peg Entwistle was an actress through and through, and it never occurred to her in this financial dire strait she was in to try and get a job in a store selling makeup at the Macy's department store or being uh, a waitress in a small restaurant or a big restaurant. Or maybe even trying to, you know, getting a job at an acting school. I don't know why she wouldn't even try that. But her her world was just about fear, about being center stage. And I think in the end, her ego is was the final rung on the ladder of everything that did her in. She had a lot of rungs yeah. on that ladder. I mean, it mm-hmm. sounds like it sounds like. Um... You know, she felt that <clears throat> that she dies w- when she feels like her dream has died, and and she she must have been in that frame of mind that uh, that her dream was 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 dead, and and so there was no reason for her to go on without that. Mm-hmm. You know her, and here's here's a sad tragic thing. Going going back to the other letter because there was actually two letters. There was a letter that her grandmother wrote on the sixteenth. You know, tell Babs not to give up, you know, and of course that letter arrived, you know, the following Monday or Tuesday, according to her brother, uh, which is just ironic. Um, But then later on in that week, a letter came from RKO telling her to report. You see, the people at RKO, they didn't even read the newspapers close enough to see. And Peg was on the top fold of the of the Los Angeles papers. And she was making the top fold of the theatrical sections of the papers back east, you know, about her suicide. And what happened was RKO, you know, they had given her a second contract, a term contract, but then they canceled that contract because all of a sudden the depression got so worse that, you know, David O. Selznick took a pay cut, okay? And Catherine Hepburn was making $500 more a week than David O. Selznick. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have this, I, yeah, because I, I, I found this memo, and this lady, and she's, you know, she likes, she likes Peg a lot. She's, I can't believe that, you know, we fired Peg Entwistle, and we hired Catherine Hepburn, who's never done but three plays, and she was only minor parts in those, never did a film. And by the way, boss, being Selznick, 
she makes fifteen hundred a week, and you only get a thousand. And RK always get a grand, and Catherine Hepburn, who never did a film, they're paying her fifteen hundred. Mm. So, and uh, you know, I don't want to take away from Catherine Hepburn because, of course, she's Catherine Hepburn. So, you know, as, as iconic as you know, any of us is Stan Wick, Garbo, Betty Davis, you know, and so forth. And but. You know, Peg, she never, for whatever reason, it all just came crushing down on her. All the realization of the broken promises, all the realization of, um, you know, one of the things that happened when she lost her New York apartment was she had two roommates. And there were letters from her roommates that were in the box, I found, where one of the roommates is um, a woman named Marie, and Marie... Uh, is, you know, worrying about, you know, they're falling behind the rent and they can't get any uh, work going. And Peg had made these promises. And Peg was paying the rent there from here. But then RKO let her go, and Peg, she just got caught up, wrapped up in herself, and she kind of became selfish. Not she didn't kind of, she did. She became selfish. She became too self-centered. You know, I, I think it's good that an actor um, has an ego. I think it's part of the driving force. It's part of the foundation, you know, that they can stand. It gives them the confidence to go out there and face the audience. You know, someone who's very shy and introverted can't go out there, you know, and, you know, start, you know, Well, an, e- an, e- an, ego, an ego is almost essential. I mean, because essentially you're in a business where you're telling people, you know, watch me. You know, I, because yeah. whenever people whenever people complain about filmmakers having egos, I'm I think, well, they're in a business where they want you to watch what they make. They're saying what I'm doing is worth you watching and paying attention to. So of course there has yeah. to be some level of ego, and it's healthy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and well, in this case, uh, though. Well, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask before I let you go because I've I've kept you so long and you've been so generous with me. Um, you know, of course, there's no way of knowing, but in your heart of hearts, where do you think her life and her career would have taken her had her had she not committed suicide? I, I think she would have she would have done very very similar to what we see with Betty Davis's career. I think in many ways. I think <clears throat> she probably would have <clears throat> done a lot of film, but mostly theater. Uh, I think she would have followed... Uh, in popularity, she would have become like a Betty Davis, but she would have followed more of the theater, like, uh, well, we just lost, uh, you know, Elaine Stritch, you know, last mm-hmm. month. And uh, I think she would have been very similar to Elaine in a lot of ways that way. Um, I think she would have found, she probably would have married a couple more times, I think. Um, I think she would have won several Tony Awards. Um, She had a lovely singing voice, um, and I only know that because of letters I found where she's mentioned she's practicing her singing, and her cousin Helen tells me this beautiful, she says, you know, Babs had the most lovely singing voice, but because she was into legitimate theater, she never got a chance to use it, you know, because she was all, it was drama and they didn't do any songs in drama. So, but I think she would have utilized that. She was practicing it. She was always honing her craft. There's no question that she was a prodigy. Um, I think, you know, the Tony award hadn't been invented by then. Um, and I think she would have won a number of Tonys. I think she would have gotten, In the end, the recognition that she longed for, and I think she would have been satisfied with her career. And she was strong and healthy, and I think she would have lived a life very similar to Betty's. I really do. 